Sophie. Sarah, thank you. And that's it from the BBC News at six. It's time now to join our news teams where you are. Goodbye. Good evening. Welcome to North West Tonight with Annabelle Tiffin. Our top story. Beyond belief, two teenagers who planned the savage killing of Brianna Jai in a Warrington Park are convicted of her murder. It's difficult to comprehend how some people can do these vile things in the world and don't understand how cruel and heartbreaking their actions can be. We talked to Brianna's mum about her daughter and the legacy she leaves. I think that we need to like, show some love and compassion to each other. If something so horrific happens, then maybe something really good could like could come out of it. Also in the programme tonight, the Department of Transport is ridiculed after it boasts about new London road improvements funded by its Network North transport programme. We're at Manchester Airport joining some of the thousands of people flying through here today as the festive season ramps up and they are coming home for Christmas. And tether down your inflatable Santas and snowmen tonight because Storm Pier will bring very strong winds across the northwest. The prosecution called it a crime beyond belief. Two teen teenagers from normal, stable family backgrounds, both intelligent, never in trouble with the police. But two teenagers with a dark fascination for violence and torture and what was described as a thirst for killing. Today, the girl and boy who can't be identified because of their age were found guilty of the brutal and meticulously planned murder of Brianna Jai in a Warrington park. Well, let's join Eunice Muller, who's been following the case at Manchester Crown Court. Eunice. Annabelle, there were gasps in the public gallery and the courtroom when the foreman returned those guilty verdicts, first for the girl and then the boy. I was sat just a few metres away from both of them, said to be intelligent and high-functioning. They appeared to show very little emotion after the conviction. After the verdicts came in, Brianna Jai's mom and dad stood here with the strength to react to those verdicts. Brianna was larger than life. She was funny, witty and fearless. We miss Brianna so much and our house feels empty without her laughter. To know how scared my usually fearless child must have been when she was alone in that park with someone that she called her friend will haunt me forever. Please have some empathy and compassion for the families of the young people convicted of this horrific crime. They too have lost a child and they must live the rest of their lives knowing what their child has done. We spoke a few days before she was taken from me and we were arranging to meet each other. It breaks me every day to know I'll never get that chance again. I wish, it, I wish I'd been there to protect her. But that's something I must live with. Some of the evidence we've heard here over the past three weeks or so has been difficult to comprehend and distressing. I've taken a look at what that evidence was and how the jury made up their minds. When Brianna Jai left her home for the last time, it was to meet a friend. But that teenager was fascinated by her and with another 15-year-old would kill in a sustained and violent assault. Brianna was stabbed 28 times to her head, neck and to the front and back of her chest. Unsurvivable injuries. It was the most brutal, cold-blooded, cruel attack on someone who was a vulnerable and anxious child. Um, it was just incredibly horrific. This handwritten note was found in the girls' bedroom after the pair were arrested. Brianna would be lured to Colchethlinia Park. There would be a code word. Both would stab their victim. Her body would then be disposed. There was a smiley and a heart in the corner. The teenagers blamed each other for the killing. The girl said the three of them were here when she got bored and decided to go for a walk to stretch her legs. She heard screaming turned round to see the boy stabbing Brianna. The boy said he was the one who'd walked away. 
in his case, behind a tree to go to the toilet. He heard sounds and it was the girl stabbing Brianna. They ran after being disturbed by dog walkers who called 999. In the months before, the pair exchanged disturbing messages, often in graphic detail. They were preoccupied with torture, murder and violence. There were searches of the restricted parts of the internet and interest in serial killers, including Harold Shipman. In one message, the girl wrote, I love watching torture vids, real ones on the dark web. I think what we probably had was a girl with murderous intent and then she managed to have access or meet someone who shared her views and was willing to do that with her. And that's probably where it tipped from fantasy into reality. The 16-year-old was transgender and had a huge following on TikTok, but she was also anxious and a nervous child and rarely went out on her own. Girl X said she was obsessed with Brianna, in court admitting also finding her attractive. Boy Wire referred to the teenager as it and used derogatory language, later called her unnatural. On the 23rd of January, Girl X said she tried to kill her with a pills overdose. Brianna's mother recalled her daughter screaming in pain, shouting, I think I'm going to die. By late January, the pair had discussed a kill list of children. The night before the killing, Boy Y agreed to bring a hunting knife he claimed to have bought on holiday with his family. He said it would 100% kill her. Bloodstained clothing and trainers were found in his bedroom. He claimed the result of touching Brianna. Girl X sent a Snapchat message after the murder to make up a cover story. Why did you ditch us for some random man from Manchester, she wrote and later posted a tribute to one of the best people I have ever met. In the days after her death, vigils were held across the UK by the LGBT community and supporters. But the motive for the killing isn't clear. But it is unusual, um, and I think in this case it, it has demonstrated that it was the, the, the thirst to kill that, that drove the defendants rather than a, having a particular motive perhaps to kill an ind a, a particular person. Boy Y gave evidence in the trial by typing on a keyboard in another room. His answers were spoken by an intermediary. He had gradually stopped speaking after his arrest and had been diagnosed with selective mutism as well as autism. Girl X also displayed signs of autism and ADHD. Very bright you know, very articulate, but I think they're probably their downfall has been their confidence or arrogance around the fact that they thought that it could take another human life and then thought there would be no um, comeuppance for them and they'd never get caught. To her many followers, Brianna Jai was happy and confident, but it was her vulnerability that made her an easy target for two teenagers who had murder on their mind. Reports will now be prepared on behalf of both defendants before Mrs Justice Yip turns her attention to sentencing. She wants all the information available in front of her, but this is likely to be a life sentence for both of them. Eunice, thanks very much. Well, the formal legal process around Brianna's murder is almost at an end, but her devastated family is still at the heart of the process of coming to terms with their loss. Brianna's mother, Esther, has been talking to our reporter, Katie Barnfield, about her hope that something good might come from this terrible tragedy. Brianna was funny. She was brave. She was strong. You always knew when Brianna was around. She was like a, a, an absolute ball of energy. <laughs> from a very, very young age, she, um, she wanted to be famous. At just 16 years old, Brianna had already started to achieve that dream. Her TikTok videos and makeup tutorials watched by thousands. She was fearless to be whoever she wanted to be, and she was she wanted to identify as a female and she wanted to wear girls' school uniform and yeah, she just she just did it. It was just it wasn't a hurdle at all for her. Take me back to that day when you found out what had happened. She messaged me to tell me that she was going out. She'd actually got on the bus by herself as well. 
which she'd never done that before and with her being a bit anxious I was so happy that she'd done that. Later that day um, I, w we, I was walking the dogs with my partner Wes as we were walking past the house I sort of joked and said that because if Brianna doesn't come home um, soon I'll probably have to ring the police. We got to the front door and the front door was open and there was two policemen stood in the house. And I remember the first thing that I said to him was that I knew, I knew that something was going to happen. I think the only way that I can describe it is like this, a hole in my heart. In the days after Brianna's death, Esther remembers seeing the vigils being held across the country in her daughter's memory and the comfort they started to bring her. When it, when it all happened, I felt like a, a knee-jerk reaction to sort of like hide away, like I even wanted to move house. I, I didn't want that amount of attention, but then when I saw the vigils and um, everybody coming together to celebrate Brianna's life, it, it changed my, my view on everything. It made me feel like there is good out there. Brianna wanted to be famous and in a really sad way, like, she is now. At Brianna's school, Birchwood Community High, her head teacher, Emma Mills, arranged for a cherry blossom tree to be planted in her memory. The cherry blossom has become um, kind of real symbol um, around Brianna. The time of year that Brianna died, all the cherry blossoms were out and everywhere you went, you just saw pink. Um, it just made us think about Brianna all the time. <laughs> the tree is now the symbol of Esther and Emma's campaign, Peace in Mind. They hope to raise enough money to train one teacher in mindfulness in every school in the country. You got one of these as well? I thought that this is, we need we need this in schools because I knew how much it had helped me. It had helped like with my mental resilience, and I knew that it was helping me through those initial stages of grief as well. I hope that Brianna's legacy is one of supporting other other young people. I think that we need to like show some love and compassion to each other. If something so horrific happens, then maybe something really good could like could come out of it. Katie Barnfield speaking to Brianna's mum about her legacy. And there's a special radio documentary on this story. The programme, The Murder of Brianna Jai, a file on four special, is available now on BBC Sounds. In other news, millions of households in the northwest could get compensation from water company United Utilities through court action, alleging they've underreported pollution incidents and overcharged customers. They're one of six water companies named in a legal challenge brought by environmental campaigner Professor Carolyn Roberts. Bus lane fines on just one street in Manchester have pulled in more than £10 million in 17 months. More than 60,000 drivers have been fined for using the bus-only lane on one section of Oxford Road in the last two years. Greater Manchester Police has been issued with an enforcement notice over hundreds of outstanding Freedom of Information requests. The Information Commissioner has given the force 35 days to come up with an action plan and they have to let a backlog of 850 overdue requests by July. Now, sometimes in politics, it's all about how things look, the optics, as they're called. Well, today, the Department of Transport was ridiculed after it tweeted a multi-million pound investment in London's roads, branding it as part of its Network North Transport programme. It's part of their promise to spend the money from the cancelled HS2 rail project on the country's roads. It didn't go down too well up north, though. Phil McCann is here and can tell us more. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Annabelle. Well, uh, have a look at this. This is the offending article, a tweet by the government's Department for Transport that was sent earlier on today, and the text of it confirmed extra funding for London's roads, saying this is only possible due to £8.3 billion of extra investment from redirected HS2 funding. Now, there are some questions about where the cash has actually come from, but that £8.3 billion is being put into something called Network North. And what's that in the corner down there? It's the Network North logo on an announcement about road funding in London. 
And no, it's not a misprint. What this has been today, though, is a bit of a gift to the Conservative government's political opponents. Let's have a look then. This is uh, Cumbrian Liberal Democrat MP Tim Farron on X Twitter today. Great to see the rural northern village of London finally getting the levelling up funding it deserves, he says. This one as well from Bolton Labour MP Yasmin Qureshi. I had to check it wasn't a parody, she says. And Greater Manchester's Labour elected Mayor Andy Burnham. Network North seems to include everywhere except the North. Shrug emoji. As you can see... This comes down to presentation. It's a stupid name. Do you mean, if you were going to cancel HS2 north of Birmingham and then not spend the money just in the north and the Midlands, which are the places that primarily are disadvantaged, then you probably should have given the plan a different name. <laughs> it's just bad, bad politics and, and bad, bad optics. So what's actually happened here? Well, in a sense, nothing, nothing new anyway. Network North was launched at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester in October. And just listen now to how the Prime Minister said the money would be spent. I am cancelling the rest of the HS2 project. And in its place, and in its place, we will, in, we will reinvest every single penny, £36 billion pounds in hundreds of new transport projects in the North and the Midlands across the country. Did you get it there right at the end? Across the country. The Transport Secretary, uh, Mark Harper, has responded to the hoo-ha that this has caused today, pointing out that far more Network North cash will be spent in the North than anywhere else. He said it's great that people are talking about it. Phil, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, we're going to continue with the theme of transport because you may have noticed it's not long until Christmas and airports across the region have been reuniting families ahead of the festive season. And all of them arriving today had a story to tell. Well, Roger has been along to Manchester Airport. <laughs> Christmas is a time for coming together and there are few places where that was more evident today than the arrivals hall at Manchester Airport. Filled with excitement and anticipation, flights landed from all around the world, bringing loved ones back home. Julie's here with daughter Leah and seven-year-old granddaughter Jessica. They're waiting for Uncle Wayne back from Melbourne in Australia for the first time in five years. BBC Radio Manchester have captured moments like this over the last decade on their annual Flying Home for Christmas programme. We get to be a part of those moments with families as they're reunited and it is such a privilege to be a part of that. And I think sometimes we're all guilty of getting a bit caught up in all the other stuff to do with Christmas when really it's the people around us that matter the most. Someone else back from down under, but via Canada, is Kay, who's returning to Southport. Mum and Dad, David and Sue, the excited welcome party. Sue, so you must be chuffed to have her back. I am chuffed. <laughs> I'm the one who's going to cry. <laughs> but, yes, it's lovely having her home. But there's a bit of a problem coming here. Wow. We're doing a surprise party for her friends. I hope you're not watching. Yeah. And now the moment which might have you reaching for the Christmas tissues. <laughs> Olivia is also back in the northwest and back in the arms of Mum Catherine and Dad Ian after 17 months away in Australia. Nice to have her home. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's hard to describe. <laughs> It's, just... it's been a long time, yeah. it really and has. You've got five children and yet yeah. it shows what every single one of them is. <laughs> yeah, I still get a good yeah. reaction even at number five. <laughs> We've got one of our kids, the eldest, is in hospital, so we want him home for Christmas. Yeah. That would be another great Christmas present, but having this one home is, is a great start. <laughs> you know, great... Something we, Christmas we didn't has started. think would happen a few weeks back. And having you yeah. home will be a tonic for your big brother, I think. I hope so, I hope Definitely. so. So we're going to go and see him soon, so yeah, yeah that would be nice. I'm excited. <laughs> Very yeah. <laughs> Scores more flights will touch down here tomorrow with plenty more Christmas stories just like these. Roger Johnson, BBC Northwest tonight at Manchester Airport. Lovely. Coming home for Christmas. Now to a man who's beaten the odds in so many ways. Dave Bolton was told he wouldn't walk again after he was hit by a lorry. He went on to become a world kickboxing champion. Then in 2015, he was given just months to live after being diagnosed with an aggressive brain tumour. Eight years later, he's not only still here, but he's running a charity in Wirral to help others living with cancer. Well, today his work was recognised with an award. Katie Waldman was there. 
Dave Bolton was given just three months to live after being diagnosed with a rare glioblastoma brain tumour. It gives me great pleasure to give this to you today. There we go. Eight years on, he's been recognised for his tireless work supporting others living with cancer. Unfortunately, I will never be a cure, I'll never be in remission. I'm currently 2% of the world's population to be surviving past their diagnosis. What Where does that feel like? It feels good, but I see the other side of it. I should be in a group of 98% to 100% people. And this is why Head of the Game Foundation started. I wanted to use my story to show other people there is hope. And so the charity was born. Dave retrained as a cancer rehabilitation coach to help others, like him, living with cancer. Like James, who was also diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour. I didn't appreciate life until I was told that it was running out, and I think a lot of people live that way. What does it mean to be able to come back here and volunteer at the place that's helped you? I, I love coming back here, you know, just for what they give me and what I can try and give back to them, it's just great. The foundation aims to improve physical and mental well-being by providing things like yoga, family counselling and financial advice, all for free. Lorraine and Ruby met during a Pilates class. I've been able to physically recover by coming here um, and that also affects your mental health, which is really important. Coming here and meeting people like Lorraine and getting that support from people who can empathise with what you're going through, it's just, it's just nice to have someone understand. <laughs> Today, the work of Ahead of the Game has been recognised with a special achievement award from the National Lottery. <laughs> Here to present it, fellow brain tumour survivor, Martin Kemp. Dave has done an incredible job with uh, helping people post-cancer after going through what is definitely the darkest time of their life and bringing them out the other side. I just love what I do. I'm grateful having terminal cancer. I know I, I have to live every day knowing that it could come back, but it's allowed me to use my story to help others, which is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. And I truly believe this is what I should have been doing. I don't even feel like I deserve it, but... I'll take, I'll take it all day. <laughs> <laughs> Katie Wilderman, BBC Northwest tonight, New Brighton. Yeah, very well deserved. Now, football and Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola says his players have a once in a lifetime opportunity after the Blues Nazy, I beg your pardon. Liverpool face West Ham in the quarterfinals of the EFL Cup at Anfield tonight, aiming to go at least one better than Neighbours Everton, who were knocked out on penalties by Fulham. Elsewhere, Blackpool beat Forest Green 3 0 in their FA Cup second round replay. Now, it was a big night here at Media City last night with the stars of sport past and present rolling up for the 70th Sports Personality of the Year award. Good job it was up here because most of the winners came from here. The big winner was, of course, Manchester United and England keeper Mary Earps. Juliet Phillips caught up with the youngest winner today, Mia Brooks, Cheshire's snowboarding superstar. Mia Brooks. Cheshire snowboarder Mia Brooks, world champion and now winner of the BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year Award. How do you even reflect on the year? To be honest, I don't even know. Like, it's one of my biggest dreams. Just one day on from her win, it was back to business for the 16-year-old. Some brief time to reflect, though. Yeah, it's pretty insane and, yeah, I was pretty shocked, but I was also, like, I was kind of hoping that I'd get it. Um, so yeah, when they call my name out, it's pretty special. You've had such an amazing year, becoming the youngest world champion in snowboarding history. What a crazy year you've had. Yeah, um, couldn't have asked for anything more, really. You know, everyone dreams of becoming world champion or Olympic champion, so if it happened to me, like, it's pretty cool. And yeah, couldn't have asked for anything more. It was a winning night for our region, with Manchester United and England goalkeeper Mary Earps becoming the third woman in three years to win the main award. Women's sport's doing all right, isn't it? <laughs> it's, 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 it's growing, it's, it's grown at an incredible rate the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, and we're here to stay. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that continue to grow in the coming years. Liverpool head athlete Katerina Johnson-Thompson came third after coming back from injury to win her second world title. <laughs> Meanwhile, Liverpool legend Sir Kenny Dalgleish remained humble, accepting the Lifetime Achievement Award. And when you get nice trophies like this, you don't do it for the recognition. You do it because you love playing sport and love playing football. Topping off their treble winning year, Manchester City won best team. Manager Pep Guardiola, best coach. And Erling Haaland was crowned World Sports Star of the Year. 
Last season was incredible. I won the treble and we did amazing. So thank you again. A day to reflect then on a night of celebration for our Northwest sporting stars. Juliet Phillips, BBC Northwest tonight. And we're staying with sporting heroes of a sort. A record-breaking 401 runners have taken to the streets of the Isle of Man for the annual Santa Dash. The event has raised more than £300,000 for charities since it began more than two decades ago. The island's food bank and a mental health charity are among those to benefit from the festive event this year. We've got all of our uh, students out supporting us and they've absolutely loved it. They've looked forward to it all week and they were cheering. And... It's for Christmas, it's for charity. There's no other reason not to do it, really. It's superb fun. We do it every year and it's so much fun. Right, let's get a look at the weather now. Here's Sarah Blizzard. Good evening. Well, we are going to start to see the winds increasing now overnight after just quite an overcast day today with a warm front. And thank you to Polly, one of our weather watchers, for capturing this picture. Maybe just the odd glimmer of brightness around to end the day. But we do have a yellow weather warning. It comes into force from midnight tonight and it applies to Thursday. Storm Pier, which has now been named by the Danish Met Service, gusts of up to 50, possibly even 60 miles an hour through the night time and into Thursday. Thursday and this is the track of that storm as it's working its way across. It will start to increase the winds though now through the evening for a time and what we will gradually start to see as well is just a lot of cloud filtering in so still bits and pieces of rain around tonight and a mild night as well despite the strength of the wind but if you've got any inflatables I would certainly look after them for the next sort of 24 hours. We are going to see those very strong gusts through the daytime damaging winds tomorrow. Still a few showers coming in on that very strong wind too but a few brighter intervals also likely and it is staying quite mild as well and even as we head towards Friday the same weather front works its way gradually northeastwards again through Friday the winds won't be quite as strong as Thursday but we will still see some blustery conditions around and the temperatures still staying mild and as we head towards this Christmas weekend if you're traveling the main concern I think will be the strength of the winds more so on Christmas Eve maybe one or two wintry showers over higher ground but in general staying quite mild. And that is it for this evening. Thank you very much for watching. I'm back with an update at half past ten. Hope you can join me then. In the meantime, have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.